Hi, and welcome to this first lecture of the course in Experimental Vibration Analysis. In this lecture, we cover dynamic signals and systems, which are covered in chapters 1 and 2 of my book, Noise and Vibration Analysis. I'm Anders Brandt, the author of this book. Before we get started, I just want to say a few things about these, this series of lectures uh, in uh, Experimental Vibration Analysis. It's first important that you realize that what I'm bringing up in these videos is not everything there is to know about every chapter. Uh, instead, I focus on things that either I know from experience are particularly difficult to understand, or things that I simply fi find uh, are very important uh, to highlight. So it's very important that you read the entire chapters. Uh, and also, I would like to um, put emphasis on the toolbox, Abravibe uh, for MATLAB, which uh, is very important as a tool to aid the learning process as well. You find this on my website. And in this toolbox, you should also look for the chapter examples. There are several MATLAB files for each chapter, which you should read through and uh, run in MATLAB in order to uh, make sure that you understand the topics. Also, at the end of each chapter in the book, there are some problems that I strongly recommend you to read and solve. On my webpage, you also find a solutions manual for these examples. So let's start with the uh, course here. First chapter is an introduction to vibration analysis. Here I just want to motivate you why you would be interested in vibration analysis at all. And if you are a civil engineer, uh, you will find vibration analysis used in many of the fields in civil engineering. Uh, for example, in structural dynamics, uh, vibrations of buildings and bridges, uh, in comfort in buildings, uh, which can cause dis wind loads, for example, can cause discomfort. Uh, vibration analysis is also used in uh, geotechnical uh, field, uh, for example, during blasting. And uh, then we have earthquake engineering, for example. If you are a mechanical engineer, you will find vibration analysis used in many different fields. Uh, for example, for general vibration control, which is a term we use for minimizing vibrations in automobiles, aerospace, uh, what have you. Then we have a particular area called fatigue engineering, where we deal with uh, loads and fatigue. So try to minimize the damaging effects of vibrations. Then you have vi comfort in vehicles, for example, either cars, trucks, trains. Uh, and for example, we have vibration testing, which is a completely different area, really, where we put sensitive equipment on a shaker and, and we shake it to make sure that the product can withstand that the uh, vibration environment that it's going to have in its lifetime. So you see, there are really many different areas where you find vibration analysis used uh, in different fields in civil engineering and mechanical engineering. This lecture then uh, is contains two parts and it's also divided uh, into two videos uh, just to uh, keep each video reasonably short. So first of all in the uh, present video we will cover dynamic signals. Uh, and the essential part of this is that we will understand that there are three signal classes that needs to be separated usually in order to be able to analyze the signals. Either we talk about periodic signals or periodic vibrations if you want, or random signals or transient signals. We will get back to those. In the second part uh, of this lecture, the second video, uh, we will cover linear systems theory. And there are essentially two tools uh, that we go through in uh, chapter two. The first one is the Laplace transform, uh, and the other one is the Fourier transform. Now, Laplace transform is not really used for vibration analysis. It's used to solve differential equations and is therefore very important in the general topic of vibration 
uh, engineering. Uh, but here we will only briefly uh, describe it. The Fourier transform, on, on the other hand, is the main tool we use for vibration analysis, I would say. So we will put some emphasis on the Fourier transform. For example, its characteristics. Uh, we will talk about frequency response functions. And we will talk about transient versus steady state. So as I said, this comes in two different videos. The video you're watching right now contains the dynamic signals discussion. And part two, video 1b, is linear systems theory. Dynamic signals. Uh, many times we divide signals into three classes, periodic, random, and transient. It is, of course, not the only way you can divide signals. You can also classify signals as either deterministic or non-deterministic. Uh, deterministic signals are typically signals that if we know a particular part of them, we have an expression that will also allow us to compute the values before and after the uh, part that we actually know. Non-deterministic signals, on the other hand, we can never predict what they will be no matter how long we have observed them. Typically, non-deterministic signals are random and some transient signals, whereas the deterministic signals are periodic and most transient signals. The simplest dynamic signal is probably a continuous sine. You should be well familiar with this mathematical function. Uh, I just want to point out that a time varying sine, x of t, uh, is determined by three parameters. The amplitude, a, the frequency, f0, and the initial angle, phi0, in this expression. Here is a typical plot of that function. Uh, in this uh, function you can see that the amplitude, the maximum of the signal, is 5. Uh, you can also see perhaps that you have 10 periods during this one second, thus the period is one tenth of a second, or the frequency f0 is 10 hertz. And then we have a, an initial angle which can be uh, given by the initial condition that uh, x of 0 is apparently 4 here. A very common trick that we do with signs is that we make the real valued actual signal, actual sign that we had in the previous slide, we make it a complex signal because complex signals uh, can very often be uh, easier to use in computations. So if we have a real valued signal, y of t, uh, that is a cosine omega t plus phi, for example, uh, then typically what we do is we add an imaginary part to this. So we let this signal be the real part. Uh, and this is done simply by specifying a new signal, which is a to e times e to j omega t plus phi. This can be rewritten as a complex constant c instead of the real valued constant a, a complex constant c times e to j omega t. Uh, this can also be expressed by c times cosine omega t plus j sine omega t, where j, of course, is the imaginary number, the square root of minus 1, which I use throughout my book. If you prefer i, you can use that as well. So essentially, the trick here is that y of t, the original actual signal that we're interested in, is the real part of the complex sig signal, which we denote y tilde. This is not the only way of explaining complex signs. There are also other ways of expressing it. But this is one of the simplest ways, I think. I want to stress that amplitude which is something we used for a single sign. Amplitude is not a very good concept. So usually you should try to avoid the mentioning amplitudes. Instead, we have uh, another concept, the RMS value, which we'll come to in the next slide. Why is then is amplitude not that such a good concept? Well, 
as you see in this plot, which shows uh, uh, the sum of two sides with two different frequencies, omega 1 and omega 2. Uh, where in the blue plot you have both signs in phase and in the green plot you have we have put one of the signs in 90 degrees off from zero initial condition you see that the amplitude or the ma sorry the maximum it's not the amplitude the maximum of the blue function is something completely different from the the uh, green function and this is caused, caused only by the initial angle. So there is really no amplitude here. Avoid amplitudes, except when you have one single sign with a single frequency. Instead, you should use RMS value. RMS value, the RMS value of a signal, is something you can always uh, compute. No matter if the signal is periodic or random, not if it's transient though, but if it's periodic or random. For s signals that are constantly on, you can compute the RMS value. Okay, uh, RMS stands for root mean square and kind of tells you the formula to compute this function or this uh, value. Uh, it is the mean, the, the square root of the mean of the integral uh, of the signal squared. For a sine wave this value is a the amplitude divided by square root of 2. But for more complex signals, complex complicated signals if you want, you use uh, the, uh, the formula to compute it. Where does the RMS value come from? Well it comes from electric circuits. If you have an AC voltage U of T and you have a resistor in the circuit uh, of R, then the RMS level is the DC voltage that you can replace the AC voltage by so that the, the same power will be dissipated in the resistor. And because electric power is proportional to the voltage squared, this becomes the mean value of the squares that we have to take into account. So the RMS value is a very important value, but you should be aware, aware that the RMS value is just one value that you can compute out of a, a dynamic signal. So it says something about the signal, but it by far says everything about the signal. We will see more about that later in the course. Right now, for dynamic signals, I just want to stress that amplitude should be avoided generally for signals. You should talk about their RMS value. Another th common thing with dynamic signals is that we get modulation phenomena. Modulation is typically when two or more frequencies are either added or multiplied. Uh, then you get can get phenomena like in the plot here. And why do we get that? Well, because the sum of two angles is related to the sum of the angles and the difference of the angles. So if we think about time varying functions, okay, sine of, let's say, omega 1t plus sine of omega 2t, you will get the sum of the frequencies and the difference of the frequencies. So if the frequencies are close, the difference will be small. That will mean that compared to the fast varying uh, uh, oscillations, you will have a slow variation on top of that, exactly as you see it in the plot here. This is often called a beating phenomena, ph phenomenon when it happens. Next thing we talk about is sine and cosine orthogonality. Now, you should remember from a course you've had probably in Fourier analysis or something similar, uh, where you talked about function orthogonality. Okay, For any rational frequencies, F1 and F2, we have that the mean value of the product of, say, cosine of 
the frequency f1 and cosine with the frequency f2. The mean value of this, so 1 over t integral from a to a plus t for some arbitrary a, where t is the period th that this product has, the mean value here is always zero, zero except if, if the frequencies f1 and f2 are identical. So any two cosines, or sines for that matter, if you replace both these with sine, two sines or cosines of, of different frequencies always have, their product always has a zero mean. If you have a sine times a cosine, you will always have a zero mean, even when the frequencies are equal. Of course, you don't have that for a cosine and a cosine, because if with the same frequency, you actually have the mean value of cosine squared or sine squared. And this is a function, of course, that varies between zero and one, and it's a symmetric function. So of course, the average of that function will be one half. Now, for any irrational frequencies, f1 or f2, or both, uh, let's say one of the frequencies is pi hertz, for example, which is an irrational number, that will mean that there is no time, t, over which this product has a definite number of periods. So there is no period over which we can integrate. So we cannot obtain an exact zero. But we will still have an oscillation symmetrically around zero. Such signals are often called almost periodic signals and we will not really treat those in this class. Uh, but you should be aware of their existence. But this doesn't change the principle of sine and cosine orthogonality. So a consequence of this orthogonality uh, is that if you have several sines of cosines in a signal, and of course we know already now before the course here that many times periodic signals, for example, can be split into a number of different sines and cosines, right? So the uh, RMS value of such a signal will be the sum of the RMS, the square root of the sum of the RMS values squared, because each pair of frequencies are independent, orthogonal, so there's no cross effect of the two. They can be summed as separate uh, vectors, if you like. Okay, Th those were the, or that was the discussion about uh, periodic signals. Now, about random signals, I just want to say that First of all, random signals uh, are signals that are unpredictable at any instant in time. They're also called stochastic processes or random signals. Uh, such ex uh, some examples of that uh, are, for example, structural responses to wind loads, uh, vibrations in a car uh, used, uh, caused by uh, the uh, road surface, and so on. And here's just an example of a random signal. We will sp devote a, a, an entire chapter to random signals, chapter four. So I won't say that much about it in this class, um, but it's important to know that it's one of the three signal classes right now. So a random signal can look like this, where you see that you have some oscillation, so, but at each instant in time, it's, it's really arbitrary what the signal is. Okay, we will get back to that in a later class. Finally, we have the transient signals. What I want to say about that is that typically a sig uh, transient is a signal with limited length. So it typic it's typically a signal that dies out after a while. An example uh, is uh, vibrations in a car passing a railroad crossing, for example. Uh, it's usually deterministic, but there are exceptions. Uh, for example, uh, burst random noise that we will use in chapter 13, which deals with uh, measuring frequency response functions. Uh, but usually, most transients, they are deterministic. 
And the main difference between a transient and the other two classes of signals, periodic and random signals, is that the transient signal is of limited length. So it's not on all the time, so to speak. This means that we can't talk about its effect, because effect is work per time unit. And there is no time unit over which we can average the power. So instead, we have to focus on its energy. That is the, the main and really only difference in the analysis of transients. You have to think about it as in terms of energy instead of in terms of power. So therefore, for example, the RMS level is not relevant for a transient because it's connected with the power. Here you see a plot of a transient, which in this case is an exponentially decaying sine wave. That concludes this lecture. You should now go to the video for lecture 1b.